There's an old Lewis Carroll story about the paradox of making a more and more detailed map. One character says to the other, what do you consider the largest map that would be really useful? The other says, well, about six inches to the mile. Six inches to the mile? Well, we tried six yards to the mile. Soon enough, we got to 100 yards to the mile. And then, the grandest idea of all, we actually made a map of the country on a scale of the mile to the mile. <laughs> Have you used it much? Well, it's never been spread out yet. The farmers objected. They said it would cover the whole country and block out the sunlight. So now we use the country itself as the map, and I assure you it does just as well. <laughs> the joke is obviously that in cartography, the strive for more and more accuracy is, of course, eventually futile. But actually today, with the latest technology, it's exactly what's happening. We're moving from static abstractions to virtual worlds, and we are actually building one-to-one -one maps of the planet. I grew up in London, and I spent most of my life building technology companies, first as a Microsoft systems engineer, uh, and then some of the early cloud computing technology. And then a few years ago, I moved to Chamonix. Like many people here, I was brought here by my passion for the mountains and climbing, following in the footsteps of Wimper, Rebufat, and other legends. I was on a mission to become a mountain guide. And in so many ways, it was the perfect antidote to my life in the city. But I also noticed another huge contrast. See, in the city, in our daily lives, digital map platforms have become a part of e almost every interaction. We use them to plot a route at the touch of a button, to see live traffic conditions, to see how far away the bus is, uh, to see if our favorite restaurant is open, and even check what things are like before we really go there. See, we've gone from static maps to dynamic, contextual, and real-time platforms. You see, these are all designed for urban environments. And so back in Chamonix, in the mountains, I found myself using old topographic maps, piecing together disparate sources of information to try and make a plan for the mountains. With all the labels removed from this map, a lot of people would struggle to recognize what's arguably the most recognizable mountain in the world, the Matterhorn. Because it's hard to translate abstractions to reality. And so, if we can't recognize the most recognizable of peaks from our maps, what else are we missing? See, at the core, maps are answers to questions. They're just a way of passing down knowledge from person to person or even generation to generation about our places. And topographic maps were designed in an era before photographs, aeroplanes, devices, or the internet. And so the art of cartography, incredible feat, was to make a single map as the best compromise to answer any number of many, many questions we would have when we went there. But we live in a different world today. We can actually build dynamic maps that answer almost any question. They can morph immediately into the perfect answer for that very question. And this is actually being driven by a huge wave of technology, possibly one of the most important of our time. So if you look at the 10 years from 2005 to 2014, there were about 180 new Earth observation satellites launched uh, orbiting the planet. But in the next 10 years, we're forecasting that to increase almost tenfold to 1,700 satellites orbiting the Earth. And what that means is, compared to 2010, by 2019, we'll be collecting 70 times the amount of data about <coughs> our planet. And even in the last few years, we've launched a type of satellite called the CubeSat. These operate in constellations, and they're orbiting the planet and actually taking photos of every point on planet Earth every day. And this means we can see, measure, and what's happening on our planet in real time. So for example, we don't need to rely on human uh, record keeping. Now we can see and keep track of the ships and containers that are going in and out of Botany Bay in Australia on a daily basis. We can identify illegal mining in Peru and see what that's happening, what its impact is daily. We can see the effect that sugarcane plantations are having on deforestation and the rate of it in Bolivia. But it's also much more than just pictures. Using the latest high-resolution satellites and drones, we're using a technique called stereophotogrammetry uh, to create these incredible accurate 3D models. So it works a little bit the way your eyes do. So when you take an image from two or more angles of the same place, using software, we can use the difference between it to calculate a 3D model from that. But the important thing is that we're now seeing a huge progress in gaming technology and rendering, which means we can take all of this data and put it into computational virtual worlds that make sense of it and even immerse ourselves in it like this. So suddenly, 
for the first time, we have detail good enough about a wide scale of the planet to make decision making at a human scale. So back in Chamonix, a team of us started thinking, what would be possible if we put all of this to use, not just for our cities and streets, but for the rest of the planet? How could we build the ultimate map for adventure? You see, other 3D maps until now have been built for a global scale and are mostly approximations, but we wanted to build a map for a very local scale. How could we make something useful for decision making and in complex environments like this, where it's intricate and the difference between even a few ma meters matters? So we started getting input from top athletes, adventurers, mountain guides, even the local mountain rescue. And then we built an ultra high resolution map of the Chamonix Valley. So we used stereoscopic satellite imagery to build a 3D model down to two meter resolution. So we had a point on the ground every two meters and we knew the height of it. It was 15 times higher resolution than all the previous maps that had been made. And we used a gaming engine to write some software so we'd take this all offline and off into the mountains. But the resolution was actually just the foundation. The key was to start building a whole set of terrain tools that we could use to provide answers for real world practical situations. And the obvious place to start was gradient or steepness because on a topographic map, to understand gradient, you need to measure the distance between the contours. It's super slow to do and pretty imprecise. So particularly as a skier, it can be potentially serious because the difference between steep and death defying is relatively small. So we made a heat map of gradient, and what this meant is you could suddenly see the terrain and the steepness and pick lines in a much more intricate way. We then did the same for orientation or aspect. We built a tool to identify flat zones or where you could place a camp or land a helicopter in the event of an emergency. Started transposing what local mountain guides knew about the level of crevasse danger in, in, in various glaciers. And then probably we started attacking one of the most complex aspects of mountain decision making. You see, avalanche risk is hugely complicated. You have to bear in mind a whole number of factors, external factors like the avalanche bulletin, the current conditions, the weather, even your specific group abilities. And you have to transpose how that relates to the specific terrain you're planning on traveling in, the altitude, aspect, gradient of terrain. And transposing all of that manually um, is incredibly error prone. So we took a statistical framework that's been developed by a Swiss mountain guide called Werner Munter, and we transposed that on the map to see if that might make it harder to miss uh, detail, harder, easier to see the, see the avalanche risk on the map, and so you'd make fewer mistakes. So we decided to put this all to the test. We had to go somewhere, uh, somewhere completely that there was, we, we had no information about, somewhere where we'd have to completely rely on the map, and somewhere we didn't know. And so spring last year, we went on a ski expedition to Kulasuk in southeast Greenland. Uh, friends had told us about the incredible mountains there, um, relatively unexplored in ski terms, but the most important thing was that the last proper map of the area was made in 1954, and uh, more importantly on a scale of one to 250,000. So in mountaineering terms, it's a bit like uh, trying to climb Everest with a road atlas. <laughs> so using what we learned, we started building a map of the whole area. It took about a week. But additionally, in Greenland, the challenge was that there's very, very little reference data available. All the knowledge is very local, bound to the people. So we built a tool that allowed us to transpose local knowledge when we got there from the community onto the map. We started talking to the hunters, the local guides, and what they told us about the area were the safe passages across the sea ice, the not-so-safe passages, uh, the hunters' cabins, the no-go areas, um, even the local po recent polar bear sightings. Um, and then we took this. And off we went. We spent about two weeks exploring the area, putting the whole map to the test. We traveled tens of kilometers across sea ice in all sorts of weather like this. And I guess I'd be lying if I said it was completely plain sailing. <laughs> we, there were definitely a lot of lessons learned from more data we should have gathered, limitations about our early process. But as time went on and we were planning, navigating, finding places to camp, uh, scoping out possible summits, we started to kind of really understand how we could use this tool and, and trust started to grow. And then towards the end of the trip, there was this kind of moment where we ended up on this ridge looking down this huge thousand meter face. And we couldn't quite see all the way across or down it. 
And whilst we planned to go this way, we couldn't actually see the route from the top. And so in skiing, it's very easy to go down and quite a lot harder to go in reverse, particularly in steep, complicated terrain. And so if we dropped in to this face and we realized that actually we couldn't get out that way, we'd be in a pretty serious situation. On one hand, <laughs> we had total trust. We knew the map was accurate. But the passage was narrow, and there really wasn't much margin for error. And so we planned this route heading out left on this, through this kind of narrow band of cliffs. And in so many ways, this was kind of this ultimate moment of truth. You know, was the map really going to be good enough? And then we kind of realized, when you're forging new territory, and in this case, I guess, like more ways than one, you really have nothing at all if you don't have courage of conviction in what you're doing. So there was only one thing to do, and that was to get on with it. <laughs> and of course, in that moment, it obviously all came together. Through, went, through the cliff man, we went and into this incredible open bowl uh, of skiing that went all the way down to the sea. And you know, in just over a week, we skied a whole number of new lines in this place that would just never have been possible before. It allowed us to push the limits in this completely unknown place but most importantly, with just a much, much larger margin of safety. And so now we want to take what we've learned and we want to build an outdoor map like this for the whole planet. And I guess the message I have today is the, more the reason that it's important more than anything. And for me, that's got nothing to do with technology. Because in this kind of hyper urbanized world that most of us spend nearly all our time in, I think more and more people are starting to realize the value of spending time in nature. Or perhaps as John Weir put it better, over-civilized people are beginning to realize that going to the mountains is going home, that wilderness is a necessity. And I'm just not just talking about the wilds of Greenland. You know, this is equally about a ride in the Scottish hills or a hike in your local national park. You know, we really believe that a better map can help people explore with more confidence, safety, and responsibility. And the other thing is that adventure is actually just the beginning. In the same way that the topographic map is useful for so many other things, you know, we're finding a whole number of areas where we can have an impact around humanitarian disaster response, wildlife conservation, deforestation. The possibilities are endless. But perhaps, most important of all, by mapping the world's natural landscape and helping people build a deeper respect for it, I believe we can help ensure that these places are preserved for future generations. And I hope you agree with me. It's a map worth making. Thank you.